Once again, taking your Bibles, turn into Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The title of the message this afternoon is Conversion and Consecration. Conversion and Consecration. Now, a few weeks ago, I was <clears throat> speaking on regeneration, and I got conversion and repentance turned around. So I, I made amends to that, but I don't think I did it good enough. So the order of things would be that we are, um, yeah, forgot what I was going to say. Um, wow, that went clear out the window. Regeneration comes first, because we can't do anything unless God does his work first. And then repentance once we are regenerated, then we understand who we are, what we are. And we repent of our sins because we see for the first time how sinful we are. And then conversion. Because then we're, we go through the process of being converted. And then consecrate. Once we're converted, then we need to consecrate our lives to Jesus Christ. Pretty much as the scripture there says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, which would be regeneration. So walk ye in him. We, but we don't want to confuse conversion and consecration. We don't want to confuse the two. In conversion, we receive. In consecration, we give. In conversion, we receive eternal life from God. In con consecration, we offer up ourselves in self-surrender to God. That's what consecrating would be. In one, we appropriate the work of Christ done of us. In the other, we fulfill the work of the Spirit in us. So we're actually fulfilling what the, the process that we've gone through. Regeneration, repentance, conversion. Those who have been partakers of his converting grace must consecrate themselves to God. Consecration should crown our conversion. If God has shown his love to us by giving his son to die as a sacrifice for our sins, let us show our love by giving ourselves to live in daily sacrifice for him. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or spiritual service to God. This is your spiritual service to God which is reasonable. There must be self-surrender to him who surrendered himself for us before Christ is indeed our all in all. That's what most people fail to do today. We fail to consecrate our lives to him. We fail to surrender our whole being to him. We are and do because he allows it. Because he has given us the ability to do so. Without him, we can do nothing. We are nothing without him. So the two points I want to bring to you this afternoon is conversion and consecration. We'll go through them. But conversion, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. That's our conversion. This text is addressed to the ungodly or strangers to grace. It's not, excuse me, it is not. The text is not addressed to the ungodly or strangers because they've been condemned. But to Christians who have received Christ Jesus the Lord, the, this scripture is for them. 
A Christian, all Christians have done this. If you're truly a Christian, you have done this. Not merely his words, but Christ himself. This is the language of free grace. Received. We received. Not earned. Purchased or won. We received of him. There is no evaluation from within, but a gift from without. We had no claim to God's grace. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 11. John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Totally eliminates free will. Totally eliminates it. This strips us from all boasting. For all we did was receive. We didn't do anything else. By faith, they received a whole Christ. His Godhead and humanity, Savior and Redeemer from sin and wrath as Christ, the anointed and commissioned by God, the only teacher and lawgiver. They received him as their sovereign Lord to rule and reign over them with individual sway. We all have the same experience, but it's different to each and every one of us because we're different. We received it in a different way. They received him into their knowledge, their understanding, their affection, and their life at their new birth. One of the questions I just answered was about our faith in the sovereignty of God. Do we have faith because God is sovereign? He does everything after counsel of his own will. I mean, is that, the, is that the purpose of our faith? Christ gave us the faith whereby to believe. But that doesn't change the fact that God is sovereign. We cannot, by faith or any other means or ways, change the sovereignty of God. It stays consistent. It stays, stays solid. It stays immovable. Whether I have faith or not doesn't change that God is sovereign and he does whatever he pleases to do. That doesn't have anything to do with it. So the answer to the, the, the question there was that in reality there is... Nothing in faith that can change the sovereignty of God. Just because God is sovereign, he does whatever he wants to do, doesn't diminish our faith or increase our faith. It's not based on his sovereignty. Whether you choose to believe something or not doesn't change the fact that God is a sovereign God. And he does in heaven what he so pleases to do. I'm not sure, was kind of perplexed by the question that was asked. So I'm not really sure where they were going with it or what they wanted to do other than maybe argue the fact about God's sovereignty. But there will be nothing ever changed the sovereignty of God. It's just like our country, America, we are a sovereign nation. Nothing should ever change that. If it changes, it's not because America itself in a whole is changed. It's that somebody is trying to change its course and rely on somebody else when we don't have to. Secondly, when we work, look at the word concentrate, cons, consecration, excuse me, as we see there in that verse, so walking in him. If we've been converted, regenerated, Repentant. 
we come to believe and understand there's our conversion. We've been converted from the old life to the new life. But consecration is the great concern of those who receive Christ. It is to walk in him. Consecrate yourself to him. Walk in him. As you receive Christ, so walk in him. As you have been rooted in him, so grow up into him. As you have been founded on him, so be built up in him. It still comes back to the fact that we are nothing and can do nothing without Christ. Many want to leave him out in the cold. Many want to put him aside and try to do everything on their own merits. And we can't do that. If we're truly Christians, we can't do that because Christian progress is not growing up for, from Christ as a starting point, but into Christ as our goal. We want to continually to grow in Christ Jesus. We want to get better at believing who he is, believing in what he does, believing that he is continually with us day in and day out. And we got to understand and realize that that's the situation at hand. If we want to leave him out in the cold, then we're going to be cold ourselves. To grow, you must remain in fellowship with Christ. See, when uh, that was one of the things that transpired, which probably we'll never understand in this life. Adam walked with God. He was with Adam in the cool of the day. There was a fellowship that we'll never know in this life. We just won't know it in this life. Adam knew it. He knew what it was like to do that. And he threw it all away. And I think that's what we do on a daily basis. We just, God's willing to walk with us in the cool of the day, but we throw it away. Because we don't consecrate ourselves. We don't submit ourselves to him. Christ in us by faith is the source of life. Christ within us through the spirit is the source of a more abundant life. We not only have life, but we can have more abundant life if we stay in Christ. Faith secures our salvation. Consecration enables us to glorify God in our Christian life because we're consecrated to him. We're, we've surrendered ourselves to him and therefore it enables us to give glory to God in all that we do and say. If you do that, many people just pat themselves on the back and say, oh, look what I did. See, we may give our possessions instead of giving ourselves. That's what a lot of people want to do. Well, I gave Christ this, and I gave Christ that, and I did this, and I did that. But that's not what he wants. He don't want your possessions. He wants you. 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. That's what a church needs to do. Give themselves totally to Christ. It's his church. Therefore, we're to treat it as such. You know, it amazes me sometimes when people don't realize that, you know, we bought the property. We bought the material. We paid to have it built. But when it comes down to the crux of the whole matter, we didn't do anything. It was God that did it all. It doesn't matter about the possession of it. It doesn't matter that we have this building. 
It matters that we give ourselves to him in the service in his church. The development of self must go before the development of property and possessions. Now, there's a lot more we could have done here. But we were really concerned about being able to come in here and worship him. We could have waited, had the money for new pews, could have waited and got the baptistry put in. I mean, there's so much more we could have done. But that wasn't our goal. So hopefully that we have devoted ourselves to the service of God and not worried about the possessions. I think when many churches are building in their building program, they got to have the best. You know, well, we don't we got a brand new building. We don't want used pews. We got a brand new building. We want to borrow from somebody else's baptism. We want our own. See, we could have been selfish in many ways. In fact, if we would have had anything to do with it, we would have had a paved drive, a paved parking lot. We would have satisfied with gravel. We had no issues with that. We weren't looking at it in that context. Walk implies motion, activity, progress. Turn over to Genesis 5. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Chapter 6 and verse 9. These are the generations of Noah, and Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. See here, the, a walk implies personal activity and progress to some end. That's where, again, Adam kind of messed up. God wasn't interested in anything else. Just walk with me. That's all he wanted. He just wanted Adam and Eve to walk with him. The person who remains where he started is not walking. See, some Christians get the idea, well, I'm saved, I don't need to do anything else. Well, that's wrong. We must not stay at the starting point, saved and satisfied. That's what many do. They're saved, they're satisfied, that's all they have to do. They don't have to do anything else. And this is far, as far as some seem to get. You just keep walking in a circle. We ought to go from babes to young men and on to fathers. Walking in Christ excludes a walking in self. How many people do you know today are walking in self? All people want to do anymore. You know, when a person, we got, before we even had all this issue with COVID and that, you know, when a, a young person would come out of college and go into the business place, here's what they wanted. How much do I get paid? They weren't thankful just to have the job. They wanted this. They want, How much do I get paid? How many days do I get off? How many holidays? How many vacation days do I get? See, they want to start up here, not down here. And I think all of us in here started down here. We worked our way up here. They don't want to do that. They want to start at the top. Because they're walking in self. What can I get out of this? What can I do? What's going to benefit me in all this? And I think when, when they become Christians, when they do become Christians... 
I think it's a disappointment to them in some manners. The more that a man walks in Christ, the more he walks out of self. As Christ comes in, self goes out. When Christ is received, self is expelled. That's the way it should be. The other example would be to take a few steps is not to walk. Just because you're doing this little baby steps, that's not walking. You're not getting anywhere. To walk in Christ is a constant, permanent, persevering, and continued thing. My first pastor told me that being a Christian is a steady walk, a continual walk. He said those that go like a house on fire will burn themselves out. A lot of times that's what happens with a young Christian. They get so enthusiastic, they get so excited, and they just end up burning some because they get what happens is they get not only confused, they get disappointed. First thing I want to do is I want to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. I want them to I wanted them to experience the same thing that I experienced. And I found out that didn't work too well. <laughs> You ever heard Brother Ross's testimony? That's kind of what he says. Man, when he got saved, he said, man, he wanted to tell everybody. He realized what it was. The door moves on hinges, but it never gets anywhere. It does not walk. It's just hanging there. Opens and closes, opens and closes. And that's the way a lot of people are today. I have two quotes from two men that were strong in their faith and strong with the Lord. And one was George Whitfield. You know who he was. He wrote, when the bishop laid his hands upon my head, if my veil heart doth not deceive me, I offered up my whole spirit, soul, and body to the service of God's sanctuary. Let come what will, life or death, depth or height. I shall henceforth live like Christ. I can call heaven and earth to witness that. When the bishop laid his hand on me, I gave myself up to be a martyr for him who hung upon the cross for me. No unto him are all future events and contingencies. I have thrown myself blindfolded and I trust without reserve into his almighty hands. John Frederick Oberlin wrote, in the name of the Lord of hosts, I this day renounce all former lords that have had dominion over me, the joys of the world in which I have too much delighted and all carnal desires. I renounce things in order that God may constitute my all. I consecrate to thee all that I am and all that I have the faculties of my mind, the members of my body, my fortune, and my time. Grant me grace, O Father of mercy, to employ all to thy glory in obedience to thy commands, for ordinately and humbly I desire to be thine through the endless ages of eternity. We may not agree with everything these two men stood for, but we can agree on what they just said. They consecrated their lives to Christ. Once they found out what it was like, then they turned themselves to him. And that's what we must do. 
See, many got the idea that it, well, it's the, it's the pastor, it's the minister, it's the deacon. They're the ones that are supposed to do all that. It's not for the lay person. It's not for the, the people that are in the congregation. It's for everybody. We're all in Christ. We need to all consecrate ourselves to Christ. In conclusion, we need to understand to be sure to begin right. But don't stop there. Just because you begin right, don't just stop there. Live under the influence of the conception which you had of the Savior when you first embraced him. So that's many things that people forget that, that day. They forget that day. They need to go back to that day and look at the zeal and the fortitude and the drive and the commitment that they had then and continue on with that. Always look to him, learn on him, lean on him and receive grace and strength from him. Can't get it anywhere else. Walk in his doctrines and ordinances. Like we talked this morning about the truth and about buying it. That's what we need to do. So when we walk in his doctrines and ordinance, what do we do? Well, here's what we must do. Walk, walk, walk. And don't stop. Keep on going and don't hesitate. If you go in and read Pilgrim's Progress, if you haven't read it, read it. But if you go back in and read it again, that was one of the faults of the Christian in the book. He stopped and pondered the situation. The one, one thing that really got me right in the, 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 the pretty close to the first part of it, he's walking and and the evangelist told him to stay on the path. He said, no matter what happens, stay on the path. Don't vary to the left. Don't vary to the right. Don't look anywhere else. Stay on the path. Well, he comes to the path. Well, the path is covered. But instead of continuing to go and walk through the weeds, the vines and everything else that was covering the path, he looked to the side and he said, oh, I'll, I'll just go around. Well, when he went around, he got sidetracked and he had a hard time getting back on the path. We have to stay on the path. We have to walk, walk, walk. May God bless his word to your heart this afternoon.